just didn't really want to cut short because they they were really very good. Very impressive. I'm just going to take a break and then we'll start at, at the latest at 18 past Martin and that that would hopefully give you give you enough time. Yep, fine. Thanks. I'll, I'll wing it, whatever it is. I'll, I'll um, yeah, I'll do. Uh, um, okay. Yeah. Thank you. No worries. Super. Thank you.
So um, we'll get back uh, on program. Thank you so much for staying with us. Uh, and um, now speaking, uh, the second keynote, I'm really pleased uh, that he has found the time to join us, is Professor Martin Oral. He is the director of the Institute of Mental Health and is involved in many um, advisory groups of government. He is on the committee for Interdem and um, uh, is involved in advising memory clinics. He's obtained many millions for his uh, project and has written many very important papers. And today he will be talking about uh, the use of uh, technology uh, for people with dementia. <coughs> Martin, would you like to start? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Eve. Yes, thanks for that introduction. And uh, it's very nice to be here. And um, thank you for the very kind welcome. So I'm going to talk about our interdisciplinary network for dementia using current technology. This is actually a grant by the uh, EU, a Marie Curie network grant for um, PhDs across Europe. And it's linked with Interdem and various other um, major organizations that you will see uh, along the bottom with too many to, to note. Um, we're also, um, Going to talk about the best practice guidance for human interaction with, with dementia, technology and dementia today and that's been uh, that's been developed led by professor rosemary Droz, who's um, one of the um one of the leads in our induct program so um so the objectives of induct um it's to develop an intersectorial educational framework for technology and care for people with dementia and to show how technology can improve the lives of people with dementia. And so one of the key things is actually to develop this multidisciplinary uh, training program across Europe and to provide a comprehensive PhD training for early stage researchers uh, on uh, dementia and the needs and giving them the right skills to work in academia, industry or the health and social sector. So some of the objectives are to look at the practical, cognitive and social factors to make technology more usable for people with dementia, to look at the effectiveness of, of current technology and look at barriers and facilitators for implementation of technology dementia care and to see how we can disseminate it. Now, this is a very nice uh, diagram described by Rose Mutros. And when we developed the proposal for Induct, one of the key things was actually that um, there was a lot of technology out there. Um, sometimes it hadn't been designed with people with dementia. Uh, sometimes it was being marketed without having been fully tested. And uh, there was a, a constant appetite for more and different types of technology. And we wanted to look at what technology was available and to actually do individual projects on those um, and to create some practical research to help technology um, be better geared towards people with dementia. So you can see we've got the, the three domains there and there's the um, four early stage researchers in the first one, then there's um, six in the second and five in the third. And the cross cutting themes are looking at um, practical cognitive and social factors, looking at effectiveness and looking at implementation. So, um, and one of our goals was developing the consensus guidelines. So you can see how the training program worked. We had a mixture of the network wide and the local doctoral training. We involved people with dementia um, through the European uh, working group for people with dementia. 
there's work on enterprise, on policy, implementation and dissemination. So you can see it's not your average training program for PhDs. And as you can see down the bottom, there's a, a great diversity of skill sets that people get. But so we weren't just training people in research, but we're training them in the broader skills around policy, entrepreneurship, PPI and implementation. Now, the idea is, the whole idea behind a lot of European research, pro research programs is to is for the betterment of people in Europe and for um, adding to the prosperity of Europe as a whole. So it's good, uh, important goals. So the idea is that it was a, it wasn't just 15 pieces of research, but it was training to create um, researchers who could have a range of skills and be um, a hireable in a range of fields, including technology, uh, academia, public health, um, and to have a broad knowledge base. And so in a sense, it's actually providing uh, people that Europe wants to hire. And um, so that will help prepare them for senior academic positions, but also help them for understanding issues around uh, the industry, around um, the Alzheimer's society and the Alzheimer's Europe, and getting good understanding of the commercial as well as the technical requirements. So as part of our collaborations, we actually linked with um, the Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's Disease International. One of our students did a, did a, did a, a secondment in Indonesia. That was Harleen Rai who worked with me um, under Alzheimer's Disease International. We worked closely with Alzheimer's Europe and the Europe working group for people with dementia. We also had uh, um, as partners the World Health Organization and the World Federation for, uh, of OT, but also we had uh, three small and medium enterprises, which were uh, technology companies which were working with us directly, where people did secondments, and then MindTech, which is a, a kind of technology uh, escalator, if you like, again, based at the Institute of Mental Health in Nottingham, which has you know, remarkable connections with industry, but it, it serves as a real interface for linking up uh, technology with researchers. So these are our 15, uh, 15 uh, researchers we had. And um, so we're looking at technology to support everyday life. Take our training, the training um, all the way along. Uh, I've got I've got somebody saying, Is everyone else losing yeah. Martin? Sorry, um, Martin, um, we, we lost so let's, you. Um, let's just. Uh, it doesn't seem to be uh, anything well, on this. The, um, I'm going to leave my um, back any second, yeah. It's well, back. I tried clicking on a link and um, it obviously didn't come up on my, um, on my iPad, but there we go. Um, so that's the, you can have a look at the dementia link. I could see it on my, my other computer here. Um, and so we're looking at the main objectives looking at practical cognitive social factors, effectiveness, and facilitation. So is the individual projects. We had one um, I see the screen. Hold a second. Just give me. Okay. Turning. Somebody's advised me to turn my graph. I'll try that. I think it's since I went to the. Um... Okay. Yeah. 
Uh, maybe maybe if you turn your camera okay. off, Martin. I've done that, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I've done that. Um, so these are the 15 induct um, yes. projects. Empowerment and surveillance for people with dementia. So this, for example, is looking at monitoring systems for people with dementia and the stigma and the human rights issues. And they found that the monitoring systems were, the same systems were marketed for um prisoners and for animals as well so they're saying oh, we can just use these for all sorts of, uh, of groups but actually um, there's a lot of human rights issues in relation to surveillance that shouldn't be forgotten um, brain training is an exclusionary process for people with dementia in the fact that they have, you know could have difficulty accessing these kind of things and actually it's it's uh, can be stigmatizing for them um, looking at access to everyday technology, people in Europe and internationally, um, developing uh, cognitive stimulation therapy for a tablet system. We've got that now called Thinkability. Looking at how computer technology can enable um, participation for people with dementia in care homes um, and using arts and crafts type of technology, exergaming. Um, using using uh, tablet technology for health promotion and social inclusion, um, using e-monitoring to help uh, monitor people's uh, people's uh, well-being, um, and then other work on palliative care and advanced care planning, um, piloting of the eye support program for family carers, which is WHO program, and Gradio, which is a Spanish. Um, a, a, a Spanish uh, cognitive rehabilitation program for people with dementia. So it seems to be taking a few seconds between going on to different programs now. Um, just give me a, uh, hang on a second, okay. Okay, so it's, it's just taking a few seconds to go across. So these are the early stage researchers and their um, and their supervisors, and now these are the, um, the best practice guidelines. So we got all the fifteen uh, induct projects to produce recommendations. So we've got a summary of recommendations of improving the usability and effectiveness of technology, and we've got a, a website, an interactive website, which can be um, updated with new recommendations. And we've got a current European project called Distinct, which is another 15 uh, PhD projects uh, on technology and dementia care, and particularly looking at social health. And we want to look at the us usability and effectiveness in the future. So, um, so this is the uh, guidance. If you want to go to the website, Actually, I was going to do that now, but I disconnected last time. Um, and you can see, and um, so the best practice guidance have now published and they're available as a PDF, but also as an interactive website linked to our uh, Dementia Induct website. And you can see the recommendations are in the three groups around practical, cognitive, pra practical and cognitive and social effectiveness and also um, implementation facilitators and barriers. So there's two formats to that. And uh, those are the particular areas for where you can start to search with the recommendations. And you can go on to uh, select which target group you want. So whether you're looking from the point of view of user of technology, developer, researcher, care provider, a policy makers or the media, that's very hands-on. And then the recommendations there can link with that. And so you can see each of the recommendations um, uh, are organized into, into the groups around um, different areas. First one around usability, and you see how that breaks down into the three themes, everyday life, meaningful activities, and healthcare technology. And so, Here's one of the recommendations. So this is about um, technologies being very important, but there's uh, problems with the increasing complexity and how people rely on them 
at home in um, traffic situations or healthcare services. And the user's ability to manage products and services has often been neglected. So people with dementia often don't use technology because it doesn't match their needs and capabilities. Um, so this is about surveillance technology. So it says providers and marketeers of surveillance technology shouldn't communicate with a wanderer with dementia discourse. They should focus on user person-centered products and use this in a non-stigmatizing way because it's not just aimed at the family care, it's actually the people with dementia who, um, you know, who it matters for because they're the people being independence but Martin I I think some people are having issues in um in hearing it um okay. not sure what we can do about already uh, still right so that's on there um, she has some wonderful work on this. You can see she's already um, published a lot of uh, papers. Martin, we, we can't hear you anymore. Can you hear me now? Yeah, that I could hear. <laughs> okay, so, um, yes, uh, so. So you can see there's quite a few uh, papers published by Yvette Vermeer. And if you want to go to the website, you can look up some of the, um, the different um, papers in relation to technology. And um, so one of the recommendations here is consider using occupational therapists to enable people with dementia to use everyday technology. We've been very lucky, really, because we've had um, uh, a wide variety of, of uh, uh, interdisciplinary backgrounds. So we've had quite a number of OTs, and this is a perfect. These are perfect projects for OTs to do because of their their very um, problem oriented problem solving uh, background. So this is um, looking at usage of technology, and this really shows that um, how much people with dementia, sorry, how people with dementia are less likely. Um, to use a whole range of technologies than people without cognitive impairment. So they mapped everyday cognitive technologies um, up to 31 different types um, for people with dementia, people without cognitive impairment, and they looked at what people are actually using. So we see that technology itself can be empowering, but it's also disempowering because uh, people can't use it or they've not been given the right kind of uh, coaching and support to use it. Um, so here we're looking at uh, meaningful activities and um, so different types of uh, technology. You can use tablets for meaningful activities. Um, you can look at how this is uh, um, how this is evaluated. I won't put the video on now because uh, it might lead to some problems, but um, this is about um, different ways you can you can solve things before you're testing the effectiveness. And we know that actually the practical issues around the effectiveness are very crucial. And there's, um, there's also other work done by Franz Verheer and his team looking at um, everyday fluctuations in things like mood and behaviors and cognition in people with mild cognitive impairment or care or carers to better understand the variations. And so this is a short video on um, on understanding um, minor changes in everyday or small fluctuations in everyday um, everyday mood and cognition. And it, here is one of the issues around um, exergaming. So this is to do with, um, says technology is, is implementation is not just about effectiveness, but also on facilitating um, uh, 
factors that are impeding things, which can include privacy and autonomy and obtrusiveness. And there's obviously issues around stigma and, pers and personability and affordability. So this is about being able to get day centres to implement extra gaming. And so one of the things is they say, well, actually, you need more than one person who's on board and trained in the, in the materials and the technology to use it. Because if there's only one person, any time that person leaves or goes to another job, um, you know, the, the activities are forgotten. I'm sure this is not just for exergaming, but this is for lots of technology related uh, activities. It's a very logical, common sense finding, but actually it's just very useful to think, well, actually, um, if you're going to try and implement technology, don't just try it with one person. Make sure you get one or a few people on board. Um, so you can see we had um, 56 recommendations overall, looking at uh, everyday life, uh, meaningful activities, uh, healthcare technology, and uh, they were separated over the three different areas. Um, so here's some summary, then some new recommendations, uh, taking a multi-perspective approach when, when getting public space technology is to improve uh, usability. One of the things is that when some initial work was done in, um, in uh, supermarkets, they found that the layout of supermarkets wasn't designed to be harmonious for people with dementia. It was actually designed to sell more products. So there might be things like uh, mirrors reflecting the fruit and the vegetables. And actually that could be perhaps confusing if people are seeing everything again in a mirror. Um, so the importance of OT assessment to help identify people's needs. Um, think about the benefits for family carers when people with dementia use technology. And of course, there are things like thinkability where the person with dementia, um, but also the family carer can use technology together. Um, again, a very common sense thing, but ensure the technology is compatible with a range of relevant platforms to promote implementation. And um, what we found is that uh, developers sometimes would only um, develop a piece of technology um, with the most modern version of, say, the iPad or Google um, uh, Plus uh, te um, technology. And actually, so that meant that uh, perhaps older people who had slightly older versions wouldn't be able to use it. So this is very important when new technology is being developed. It needs to be, have a range of, a range of um of uh, compatibilities and also having a distinct selection of roles and responsibilities for staff when implementing technologies in say care homes. Um, one of our pieces of work was uh, by uh, Alini and uh, Barroso and she was looking at the use of, um, of iPads in care homes and um, to use arts and crafts technology it was very popular and uh, you know an interesting piece of innovation. So the hope, what we're hoping for for these best practice guidelines is they're relevant, their knowledge and recommendations for further development. There's clinical relevance, so we can look at usability and implementation. And we hope that they um, contribute to the availability of user-friendly, useful and easily implementable technology uh, for people with um, dementia and their carers and a more dementia-friendly society. So. Um, we're implementing the guidelines through um, the INDUCT, uh, the National Alzheimer's Associations, Alzheimer Europe, publications in uh, scientific and professional journals, discussing them with stakeholders at conferences, and um, we want to make use of it as well. And I'll thank Rosemary Dose, who did most of the slides uh, for this. And uh, before I finish, I'll just mention Interdem, because Interdem's a European association for um, research in dementia care, and it's a network across Europe. I think about 20 countries are involved. And if you're an established researcher with a PhD in publications, you can become a member of Interdem. But we also have a really active um, Interdem Academy where, um, uh, where we have an active Interdem Academy where we um, provide opportunities and training sessions for um, PhD students and early stage researchers 
Uh, that includes traveling fellowships, uh, workshops, and a variety of other um, opportunities for um, presentations uh, linking with outside of Europe. So do think of joining the INSTEM Academy, um, think of joining INTERDEM, and uh, we'd, we'd be very pleased to have people make inquiries. You can always write to me if you want to, and um, or look at the INTERDEM website. So um, the best practice, finally, the best practice guidance um, sets the scene for the new uh, grant that we've got, which is running into 2023, um, looking at the impact on social health. So what's social health? People being able to fulfill your potential in society, self-management in daily life and social participations and meaningful activities. So part of social health is being able to fulfill your societal obligations. And the distinct recommendations will be rolled into the induct ones. So um, thank you very much for listening. There's the um, website link at the bottom. There's Rosemary Joe's address if you want to contact Rosemary about the guidelines. And uh, by all means, um, you know, feel free to contact me um, directly about the project or if you'd like about it today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Martin. That was uh, a really interesting talk. I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry that we had to technological issues. I think it was kind of illustrative of, of some of the issues you mentioned and, and were mentioned before is that unless we have uh, a big team of people around us we were constantly conferring yes. here it's like where is it at and it's oh it's because he has his camera on or maybe not you know frantically trying yes. to get you back um but uh i think your your guidelines the developed guidelines will be really useful for our thinking about the next grants um you know really great to have that um one of the really interesting issues you came up with was the use of OT specialists. And this is something that came up before. Almost, um, am I right in thinking that this, these are translators, people who sort of translate the academic recommendation towards the patient well, in a more a, practical point of view? It, it, it's, a, it's a variety of people. I mean, we've had... Um, We've got some occupational therapists on the distinct program at the moment. We've got one from uh, Singapore. We've got one from uh, Trinidad and Tobago. So we were able to recruit people from all over the world. And this actually, um, for occupational therapists, it gives them a really good chance to, um, to develop their academic skills in something that's really very relevant to their everyday work. Mm -hmm. So um, when, you, when you get an OT as a researcher, I think it's, uh, you know, you, you get this added expertise. Um, yeah. And so they've done some really important projects about uh, the previous ones did work on how people can travel around London, looking at the various technological obstacles, you know, including, mm -hmm. you know, using travel cards, uh, you know, understanding how all the gates and things work and how maps work these days. Um, so, but in practice, I suppose one of the things is, um, there's, I think we're in, we're in a bit of a gap now because we're in a, in a situation where um, older people are using much more technology than they were in the last mm. two years. I mean, there's been incredible, I think, the leap in technology use by, by myself as well, um, you know, using Zoom now and doing everything online. So technology use has really accelerated, but for the people with dementia, you know, they'll, they'll be lagging behind not just because the technology needs to be better better geared up towards them easier to use more practical but also because they've not used that they may not have used technology before they had dementia That's right. so actually it's the you know the dementia's um taken over before they've had the big technology leap forward and so it's a bit i mean it's scary for me as well but it can be a bit scary and um, you know, disorientating for people because actually they, you know, they um, they can be a bit left behind, and so we need to make bigger efforts with people with dementia to help them um, use technology, but create technology for them mm -hmm. that truly involves them in the design and the testing. Yeah, I think so. Two elements come back here, which is working very closely with people with dementia themselves. 
perhaps also using persona for the design. The other thing you mentioned was um, really interesting about who is going to help people. And if we're talking about staff, and this is something Tracy mentioned with MANCAP, is about training the staff. Now, one of the issues in social care, obviously, and, and, and healthcare in general, is the turnover, incredibly high turnover of staff and our inability to keep people on such low salaries with low job satisfaction, high workload in position. So something has got to be done that obviously perhaps at a policy level, you know, by increasing pay, obviously, but on the other hand, I think also the, did you find anything in your research about increasing job satisfaction? For instance, the Tova Tafel, this Dutch, a uh, piece of equipment, you know, which is such fun um, people, well, staff and people with dementia. I don't know that we looked at that in particular, mm -hmm. but I, I mean, I think that if we, if we look at um, Claudio's recent uh, work mm -hmm. on actually, uh, you know, linkage partnership trust, that they really, they really kind of went for it. And I think there'd be a yeah. great deal of satisfaction from staff thinking, look, we managed to do it anyway. That's right. I mean, there is, we're, we're entering a kind of, um, we're going to be in a hybrid world in the future where some things are done online and some things are done in person. Mm. But I think one of the elements uh, that's important is actually getting, making that contact, having that bond with people initially to introduce them to technology, to go through it with them, to take the stigma out, out of it and yeah. to kind of boost their morale is, um, is really important um, and that's just harder to do online um, mm -hmm. because you know it's hard to get the, the human element you know mm -hmm. but we need to find a way of training the trainer in an effective way I agree yeah I, I think, agree I think that seems to be a bit of the missing link is what Martin's talking about is extremely relevant to people with learning yes. disabilities as well there, there is a very very strong correlation there mm -hmm. So we definitely have to be looking at what came out of these these best practice guidelines when we're thinking about proposals. This yeah. would be wonderful. Any other questions from uh, our audience here? We were joined by Professor Jim Horn, who came particularly for your talk, Martin. Oh, thank you. That's um, nice. <laughs> he's, uh, uh, he was, we unfortunately lost him to Leicester, but he was our sleep expert and now is looking at COVID and brain fog and perhaps the use of cognitive stimulation therapy, um, looking at promotion of sleep, physical activity, because he's obviously a sleep expert. So okay. Things he's looking at. Um, and any questions from, from the audience, Jim, for instance? Or Tracy? Tracy's got... Uh, somebody's, Scott Markham's got his hand up. Okay, sorry. Uh, Tra Tracy first, because I saw her first, and okay. then we'll have Scott. Um, I just wonder whether he, he look, he's looking at the... Um interrelationship between dementia and people with a learning disability with their um with the rates of dementia being higher than people with learning disability has that been considered in any of the studies have you looked have you included people with learning disability martin or was that an inclusion criteria uh, for your eu program well i don't think um we did uh, specifically and I, I would imagine that a lot of the projects um probably didn't use include people with learning disability Partly because, um, you know, their recruitment, you know, their recruitment strategies. Yeah. It's not that, so it may be that in some projects they were excluded, but it may also be that if you're looking around the regular memory service or the care home or things like that, actually you're looking in the wrong place to find people with um, a learned disability. There has been some work on CST with learned disability. Okay. There's some... Um, I think there's a paper by Afia Ali um, recently you're looking at a pilot project on it. Great. Did, yeah. did it work? Um, I'd have to look it up, I'm afraid. <laughs> I'm, so not sure really great, I'm not sure if it's a great program. Do yeah. you know it? No. So they have diff about, well, the program I know, they have different programs, but there's, for instance, 14 different activities you work through either with a group or with um, a relative. And you do different things like you do it ranges from ball games to arithmetic where you say well you know uh, 
you have five pounds, what could you buy for it? What could you buy for it when you were young? You know, so people have to do a bit of reminiscence, a bit of uh, uh, calculate calculus um i would imagine some of these are very very good i mean some of them are crafts for instance and this is one of the few programs the csd that really worked sort of actually I, shown efficacy i'm selling your program i'm just thank you much i'm just looking it up um, um you can buy it for 16 pounds online uh, i need to have some money for this i'm always selling your program you. <laughs> but it is it is the only program that really really works yeah. perhaps maybe clive bollard what do you think about his program the well program works mm -hmm. um yes i i was involved in that as well as one of the um, um co-investigators the um there was a, a paper on learned disabilities and cst which came out in aging and mental health last year okay or um came out actually this year in january um, and it was a feasibility study, and it looked that um, it, it showed that there was a high level of satisfaction and quality of life improved at 21 weeks. But it was a small scale trial, and it was, I mean, hopefully the grounding for a larger scale study. So that's um, brilliant. That's the benefits of Google Scholar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Scott, I'm so sorry I overlooked you earlier. That's okay. The audience. Uh, so thanks, Martin. I've, I've got quite a lot of questions. So I'm going to pick my top okay? four, but they're going I'm to be quick. quite quick. So how did you um, how did you measure the improvements to quality of life for the end user, the person with um, dementia? Or did I've you? Got quick, I've got a quick answer for that, which is we're talking about 15 projects. So yeah. I think people use the um, measured it in different ways. I've used a variety of things. I've used the DemQual. Previously, we've used the QualAD, which is pretty good and easy to do in um, the CST programs. We've also used the EQ5D, which is actually uh, not a bad measure. It's reasonably good in dementia, benefits that it's well understood. And also it has a, you can use um, uh, cost, you can look at cost effectiveness. Okay. Great. And there's a lot of similar themes to what you, the 15 projects you went to the, for what we're looking yeah. at in MENCAP at the moment. Um, okay. Is there a, a lessons, do's and don'ts with that sort of knowledge base that you were talking about online? So as well as the the uh, the advisory stuff, have you got a, a catalogue of don't do this in your project that you can share? Um, well, I think that's really embedded in the guidelines. So okay, I think you guidelines. Yeah. have a tour around the guidelines because the guidelines if there's something that you should do, it also tell you something about, about you know, why you should do this in preference to, for example, on the surveillance work, it said, well, don't describe people as wanderers. You know, these are the, these people are the problem wanderers. It's actually, you've got to engage with people and work with them well, thank you. Yeah, and is that going to be a maintained knowledge base? So August, 2020 was the last time it was updated. Is that um, it's, it's being maintained because we've got another four year grant, which is nice. Okay, brilliant. So we'll and keep then, it going as long as we can. We've got no plans to terminate it at the moment. Um, and you can download a copy of the recommendations if you want, yeah. And, and probably the one that's more difficult, are you able to share any of the cost of any of the programmes offline? Just if we were building rough order magnitude, certainly around the empowerment and surveillance and the use of and access to everyday technology. I don't know if there's a, well, a um, breakdown of spend and what you got for that spend well the way the um eu does these grants is different because what the eu does is it gives every phd student or esr it gives them a, a fixed salary based on what country they live in and they have some training and research costs to do with that so actually um you know you could divide our grant into 15 and say well this is the overall cost for people um and um so the the cost is it's not like a regular research project where you right. say okay we'll need a research assistant at this level you just put in and then the eu says okay well you, we pay you this much because each each um researcher gets this salary if you're in the czech republic you get different from in the netherlands say okay. and then there's this amount of money to go with it which is for training so they are generously funded yeah. um yeah probably less meaningful for us the way you've just described it as well so yeah and it's so, so yeah uh it's okay. a phd student plus a bit extra yeah okay thanks very much martin 
Thank you. Martin, what about your Indonesian PhD? Did she do any work on CST there? I know they're quite big. Uh, yes, um, actually, as you know, um, uh, they actually they've they've implemented CST yes. in Indonesia, yes, which right. they they apparently they I think you you may have told me they they're good at just taking things and things and saying oh we'll do we, you know we can do this and they do it immediately yeah and they do yeah. and and there is a paper um Harleen Rye with myself. And with um, Indonesian researchers yeah. um, looking at um, what was needed to be done to adapt individual CST for people with dementia in Indonesia. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. this was a qualitative study, um, but it's published, which is nice. Yeah. Yeah. No, they're very good in Indonesia, very quickly yeah, implementing yeah. Uh, whatever works. And it's rolled out nationally as well. Yeah, it's, it's um, brilliant. It's impressive. Yeah. And, um, yeah. And it was nice to collaborate on a paper with mm. them because yeah, um, yeah very you know, quick. We quick. all made a contribution, yeah. Mm. Oh, lovely. Well, that was wonderful. Thank you so much, and and thank you for your flexibility. And sorry again for running late. I think lots of food for thought. I will definitely um, look at the guidelines. Sorry, there's something from Saul Saul Albert. Um, uh, there's oh, the, we yes. we it, how to involve people with dementia in our designs. Harleen and Rye and I published a paper including guidance on how to involve people with dementia um, in, uh, in developing technology. Okay. So it's worth looking at that. It was a review plus best practice guidance. Also, um, Claudio and I and other colleagues published a paper a few years ago on having people with dementia as peer researchers and what were the things to consider. So. Um, uh, Any there, particular this, journal? Do you remember the journal? Um, I think that was the International Journal of Geriatric Psychiatry was with Claudio. Um, the one with Harleen Rai, if you just put Rai, R-A-I and Oral in, you'll, um, yeah. we published a few things together, but that'll, that'll come yeah. out quite easily. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank nice you to see so you much. all. Thank you very much. Thank um, you. See you soon. And thanks for the questions. Yeah. Um, thank you. Bye-bye for now. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks. Um, so our next speaker, last speaker before the sand pits, um, is uh, Gisela Reis Cruz. Is that you? No. Who are you anyway? Um, I'm... <laughs> oh, I saw you the other 